Praise God. We're going to be in Romans chapter 1. Uh, while we're getting there, we're going to be in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 is where we'll start. Uh, a couple of couple of verses, though, of Scripture that were on my heart had to do with uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 3. If you'll remember um, that Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, and he said that you Pharisees, y'all can see that the sky is red, and you can say that there's going to be fair weather today. And then the next day you'll say, oh, the sky is red, but the sky is lowering, right? And that's that word lowering right there, it means it's cloudy, right? And, and it means it's a sad sky. And so you say, oh, it's going to be storming. He said, you can read the signs of the sky, but you can't, you can't tell the signs of the season, right? Of the signs of the times. And also in Matthew 24, 32, Jesus talked about the fig tree. And in, when he was talking about the fig tree, he said, whenever the, the, the branch is tender and it shoots forth the leaf, you're going to know that the seasons are here. All the things that I spoke to you and told you that the end was coming, right? Whenever there would be false Christ, whenever there would be famine, whenever there would be wars and rumors of wars, whenever there would be pestilences. And he said, when you see that tender branch, just like a fig tree shoots out that tender branch and then it brings a leaf, then what you know is that summer is near. He said, when you begin to see these things, you need to understand that you're near the end you're nearing the time it's even it's even upon the door and so what I wanted to say is with the message tonight I want to I want to say that listen the times are changing I, I don't think that I have to convince you of that most people that I talk to the guys in jail they understood it today most people that I talk to even in the clinic people that aren't even saved I had they say something's up Okay, but, but at the same time, people aren't necessarily running towards Jesus. And it seems like it makes sense to me that definitely his church and his people that know him and know about his great name would be running towards Jesus whenever we see the signs of the times that we're in. Jesus already said it, also said in the book of Luke, he said this, that, that this that not one stone will be left on another in this temple because you missed your day of visitation. Now, I'm not expecting that I'm talking to anybody here tonight that's going to miss their visitation or their time of visitation with the Lord. I believe that all of us in the house of God tonight uh, are, are, are hyper aware of where we are in things. And I, and I hope and pray that we're getting our heart, our own hearts right with the Lord. Amen. But, but I will say that, that I do believe that there's going to be a large portion of what we call the church that is not right. prepared and is not ready in their heart for the return of the Lord and for the things that lie ahead. And so, and, and I believe that we saw a little bit of a sign of that. I really, whenever it, it happened, I mentioned it Sunday, that whole visibility day thing. I didn't even know that I was going to really say a whole lot about it because it really just doesn't even surprise me, to be honest with you. Like, I expect these things to happen. I've been expecting these things to happen more and more, and it's just going to keep on happening. The days are going to keep growing darker, and it's not, we're not going to see really true peace on the earth until the prince of peace returns but that whole visibility day on the transgender they kind of picked another day to do it they could but but they announced it on the day that was celebrated as resurrection sunday the resurrection of our lord and and that's what they chose to do and i don't believe that it was an accident i believe it was a purposeful move and um and i believe that like i said we're going to continue to see more of that now i'm actually in the esv version i wanted to read the ESV version for Romans chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. So it says right here, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Before we keep moving on, because I really wanted to get to verse 18, I just wanted you to see, though, that it's within the gospel itself, it contains the power of God. Amen. I want to encourage you to know that as you live your life, if you can have an opportunity just to share a little bit of the gospel, and you know that the word gospel literally means good news, and the good news 
is all about Jesus, amen, all about Jesus and all about what he has come to do within the gospel itself. There is an inherent power that can transform and change people's lives. Yes. The first Corinthians one eighteen says this, that the preaching of the cross yes, is yes. foolishness to those who are perishing, but unto us who are saved, it is the power of God. The gospel yes. is the message of the cross. The word message there literally is word. The gospel is the word of the cross because the good news is that it wasn't really good at first. It was great whenever God was done with it, the creation. He looked at all of the creation and he said, it is good, amen. And then the serpent came in and brought deception. And so before the good news of Jesus came, there was some bad news. Mankind was, was separated outside of the garden. You know the story. He was locked outside of the garden. But God had a plan immediately by the clothing of the skins of an innocent animal. That animal had nothing to do with Adam and Eve's sin, but God performed the first sacrifice in the garden, and from that day moving forward, he has been bringing us and preparing the world for Jesus, amen, and that's the good news of the gospel, Jesus Christ and him crucified, the sacrifice that was slain before the foundation of the earth, why? Because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the good news of the gospel. You know, it goes on to say in the first Corinthians chapter one, it says that the, that the, that the world became the, the wisdom of the world, that God confi confounds the wisdom of the world through the foolishness of preaching. Yes. That word preaching is different in the latter part of 1 Corinthians 1 than, than the preaching of the cross. Because the preaching of the cross in verse, in verse 18 is actually talking about the word of the cross, the logos. It's actually the essence of the word of the cross, which is Jesus and what he did for us at the cross. Amen. It's the, it's the word of it. It's the message of it. But the other word is kerygma. It's a long story, but it has to do with proclaiming. There's a purpose in proclaiming the truth. It's like a herald. Amen. I used to talk about that all the time where you'd have a scroll like, and the herald is a mouthpiece of a king. And he'd unroll the scroll and he'd say, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye, hear what the king has to say. And so it's a proclamation of king and kingdom. And it's important that you understand, you know, John and I were talking earlier, and it's amazing. I can't even remember how you said it, but it was good, whatever you said, that, oh, he said whenever the Holy Spirit came into his heart, something like that, when he truly got born again, he immediately, his eyes were opened to a spirit world that he never even knew existed wow. before. Isn't that a good way to put it? You, have y'all experienced that, by the way? If you haven't experienced it, oh, he's just one name away. He's just one call away. Yes, Jesus, worthy is the lamb that was slain for us. Amen. Son of God and man. Hallelujah. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, you call on that name, and when you mean it from your heart, it changes everything. Praise God. And so we get ushered into a new world that we couldn't even, that we didn't even know was here. And that's the message of the cross. That's the message of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. And there's power in that. Amen. You know, I, I, I debated whether I was going to do this because I don't know for sure that the guy got saved. But there's a guy that I met before I started preaching at the jail. And then he ended up in the jail and, and then, and I mailed him a, a, a Bible, right? And, and he'd been coming to the, to the jail. And, and most of the time he just looks real sad. You know what I'm saying? And I could tell he doesn't know a whole lot about the Bible because the Bible I gave him was a new Testament. Then I would say, well, let's turn to second Chronicles and he'd be looking fella. And you know, I was like, no, I'm sorry. You don't have that. But I did mail him a full Bible today because, because I was thinking about that. And, and so I noticed that he wasn't really around a whole lot lately. And I was thinking, well, man, maybe, I mean, his name's still on the list. Maybe he just doesn't want to come anymore. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I need to scratch him off the list, you know, because if he's not on the list, 
that if he's on the list and he's not coming, that means somebody else can't come, right? right. And then they, oh, no, no, he's probably going to be here. He's a trustee now. And sure enough, he came walking in. He had a little bit more freedom. He walks in, got his Bible in his hand. He looked a little bit different in his countenance. He would kind of like kind of smile on his face. And he sat down next to some other guy and he kind of patted him on the back. And he like, look, he ain't never acted like that before. And then, and then all of a sudden, I got to somewhere whenever I was talking and I said something about King David. And when I did, all of a sudden, I seen a bunch of water start welling up in his eyes. Uh, and I started to I, I started to think to myself, I think this old boy done got saved. I think this boy done received yeah. Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Something's different about his countenance. Something has happened to him. And listen, I'm offering everybody to pray and to receive Christ, but I most of the time tell them you ain't got to pray right now. You can get along with the Lord in your bunk tonight. But what you need to know is you need to be born again. You need to be converted. True conversion must take place. And when the light of God comes into your heart, you'll never be the same again. God used the foolishness of preaching to confound the wise. The world thinks it's real wise, my friend. And that's what I'm trying to talk to you about tonight is trying to talk to you about the wisdom of the world. And I'm trying to talk to you about the signs of the times. And I'm trying to tell you that we got to be prepared and we need to get our heart ready. Amen. Right. We need to get our heart ready for the return of our king. Praise God. Look at verse 18 of going back to Romans chapter 1, verse 18. We're still in the ESV version. I wanted you to see this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. In the King James Version, it actually says... They hold the truth. So that's why I wanted to use the ESV because it's the same meaning in the King James, but it's a little harder to understand what's really being said here. It's saying that unrighteous men suppress the truth. They hold the truth down. People don't want the truth spoken. Powerful people. This has been going on. Humanity has been trying to suppress the truth of God's word, because where there's where the truth of God is revealed, then the, then the power of God is revealed, and that the hearts of God's people are freed, they're liberated. Right. Even Martin Luther, the one who, because of him, the Protestant Reformation took place. His story is that he was bound in religion. He was a he was a monk. Right. And, and, and he was bound in religion, but he was reading the word of God. And it said that passage of scripture for the just shall live by faith. And when he read it, read it one time, it, 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 something, I mean, he probably read it more than that. But when he read it that time, it was like the word of God left off the page and went straight into his heart. Yeah. And, it, and he is. He became aware of a spiritual world that he never even knew right. existed again. And he didn't, wasn't even trying to cause a conflict. He just went to the church door and he nailed 95 questions. I'm just asking for some answers. Why do we do this? Why is it this way whenever the word of God says this? He, his eyes were enlightened. The apostle Paul said that I pray that your spirit, that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. That your eyes would be open to this spiritual world that's going on all around us. Come on. I tried to talk to those jailers, those inmates today. I'm like, look, I don't know what you understand about the spirit realm. And I'm not trying to get all fancy on you. But some, we live in a 3D world. Y'all know that, what I'm talking about? Like I can look at you and I can see you around, wrapped around your head. You got a set of ears on. I can see depth. I can see Robert's there. I can see, and, and I can see back there. And so there's depth. Three days. I, I, maybe this is a bad way to say it, but some people call the spiritual realm the fourth dimension. I'm not trying to say that, but the point is, is that it's another dimension and that we can't see it with our physical eyes. But I'm here to tell you that it's existing right here where we are. The Apostle Paul warned us that we're not in a wrestling match with flesh and blood, but that we're in a wrestling match with with principalities and powers, with world rulers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. We don't have to fear that. In Christ, we have power. Amen. He, he told us he gave us authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. But I need you to understand that, that you are, if you are a believer, and even if you're not a believer, you're in a spiritual warfare. Amen. And, and the enemy does not like you. 
He may act like he wants to be your friend. And a lot of times, I mean, this has nothing to do with my message. But a lot of times, the people that act like they want to be your friends, the enemy's using them as vessels to get at you and to mess you up. And, and the Lord wants the truth of the gospel to grab a hold of you and to reveal truth to you. And it's important that we understand this because there's a line being drawn in the sand. And that's what I wanted to tell you. And the Lord started speaking that to me at least a year ago before I walked across, right before I walked across last year. And he told me, he said, I want you to tell them out there that there's, I'm drawing a line in the sand. And that the words, I love you, I love you, are no longer good for me. The Lord's like, no, I want you to, I want my people to serve me. I want my people to serve me. And there's going to be a line drawn in the sand and people are going to have to make decisions on whether or not they're going to serve him yes. or not serve him. And so I just want to encourage you to understand that as the days continue on, that's going to be the dividing line. He, he, that, that's exactly what Moses said when he came down off of the mountain with the Ten Commandments. And he saw that they had created a golden calf, right? They had created a golden calf and they were worshiping and Moses drew a line in the sand and said, whoever's for the Lord, you get on this side of the line. And, and, and that's exactly what's going on today. People are trying to have a mixture of the world and Lord, yeah. with the Lord. And all I can say is, is Lord help us. And so real quick, I want to give you a little definition for the wrath or at least a working definition. You don't have to write this down because I'm just kind of like ad-libbing it. But that word wrath right there in verse 18 is not the kind of wrath. It's a different word. And it's not the context of Revelation wrath. You know, in the book of Revelation, people are going to be afflicted with boils and sores. There's going to be earthquakes and there's going to be a release from the bottomless pit of, of demonic spirits. Uh, and the, their fallen angel, Apollyon or Abaddon, is, is the angel over the pit. You understand? It's gonna, it's, they're going to have a scorpion's tail. They're going to sting men. They're going to be in pain for six months. That's the wrath of God right there. The church will be gone at that time. Amen. Praise God for that. The blessed hope. Thank you, right. Jesus. We'll be gone for that part. Hallelujah. But this wrath talking about right here is not the same thing. And, and if we get through it, what I need you to understand what this wrath is, is that it's a slow spiraling downward of morality. Yes, yes. Slowly but surely, That's you right. get darker and darker, and it brings you further and further because it's because of the suppression of the truth. And so it's happening on the earth yes. as we sit here, stand here, and Talk to one another. It's happening right now upon the earth that we're living on. There's a, a moral decay that's happening in society. The Lord warned us that it was going to happen. That, that they were going to call good evil and call evil good. And it's happening, right? And so I want you to know. But before we talk about suppressing the truth and the result of that, let's take a look at the importance of embracing the truth, if you will. So you can switch over to King James Version now, if you can, and put up there Psalm 43, verse 3. And as they're putting Psalm 43, verse 3, the first point I want to make about this is this. The psalmist reveals that truth leads to the presence of God. I want to repeat that for you again. Truth leads to the presence of God. Amen. So look at this. Psalm 43, 3. It says, oh, send out your light. And your truth, let them lead me, let them bring me unto your holy hill and to your tabernacles. Now, whenever Brother Solomon preached on the tabernacle of David, right? What was in the tabernacle that he talked about? The holy of, well, he talked about the Ark of the Covenant. And what have we, what have we learned in the book of Exodus? That the Ark of the Covenant is where the presence of God would dwell between the cherubim, right? We've talked about, so whenever you hear the word Ark of the Covenant, you should automatically think about the presence of God. When the Word of God says that they marched around Jericho and that the Ark was before them, what we need to understand is that God, they put the presence of God out before them in the midst of the yeah. battle. Whenever you find yourself in the midst of the battles of life, you should 
should be allowing the presence of the Lord to go before you. You should be putting God in the midst of your battles. You should be calling on the name of Jesus and not handling it the way that your old man would have handled it because that's what the people of God do. So he says, send your light, send your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill. Hallelujah. The hill, the holy hill he's talking about is Zion. That's its name. And that's where the temple would end up being built. And that's where the presence of the living God was. And David is saying that your pres your truth leads me. Your light and your truth will lead me to the presence of God. And I want you to see this real quick. Psalm 24 verses 3 through 4. It says this. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? It's talking about that same hill. So he's talking about who's going to be able to enter in to the presence of the Lord. Who, who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to vanity nor sworn deceitfully. The truth of God's word teaches us that we are not to lift up our soul to something that is vain. Some translations say idols. There, I'm going to warn you, church, that, that the things of the world that we put in our life, that we put our focus on instead of the things of God, can become idols in our life. I use myself all the time as examples. You, the, the things that I have unfortunately allowed to become bigger than what they were supposed to be in my life. I mean, one thing I talked about was fitness. I mean, I probably need to get a little bit more of that, but hallelujah. I got to the point where it almost became a God in my life. Well, it was becoming a God in my life because it was getting between me and the Lord. It was getting between me and the presence of God. Okay, and, and, and we can do that with just about anything if we're not careful. But, but look what he says. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. You know, I want you to know that the truth will cleanse you. It says that in, in Ephesians chapter 5. It says that in Ephesians 5 that he is going to cleanse his bride. He's going to wash his bride with the with the water of the word. The Lord uses the word of God and the yeah. truth in God's word to wash and to cleanse his bride. He's coming back for a bride that is without spot, blemish, without wrinkle. A cleansed bride. Amen. And the truth of God's word will lead us towards the truth of cleansing. It's about an intimate relationship with the Lord, my friend. Jesus died on the cross so that you and I could enter into yes. his presence. Amen. I'm here to tell you right now, that's the whole point. Listen, but not just for that, for his presence today. But like we talked about last week or whatever the case, is that ultimately there's an eternity to gain. And, and if you and I aren't really liking the presence of the Lord now, what are we going to do when we get there? We need to associate ourselves with the truth of God and let the truth of God begin to cleanse us. What's going to happen when you, when you approach the word of God properly? Because see, the word of God lives in you now. The Logos, which is the word of God, when you were converted, moved into the inside of you. But the reality of it is, is this. Is that the more world you put in you and the less word you put in you, then instead of being cleansed and allowing the light and truth to lead you and guide you, you now are walking more into the midst of darkness and the Lord's not able to reveal to you the things that he wants to deal with. Not that he can't, but that's how God deals with us. When we get into the word of God and he reveals those things in our life that the Holy Spirit's not pleased with. And then what we do at that point in time is we realize, Lord, I can't get rid of this. I've tried to get rid of this. But you know what I believe? I believe you died on the cross so that this thing right here can die in me. I'm telling you right now, that's the whole point to the cross. is is not just so that you could be saved, but so that through faith and continuing faith in the finished work of Christ, that the Holy Spirit would flow in you, cleanse you, amen, and begin to change you on the inside. You can't cleanse yourself. You can't fix yourself up. None of us can. But, but the good news is that what Jesus did, amen, he'll kill those things in our life and he'll replace it with the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. I believe that. And then, but until we allow the Word of God to have its way. All right. So that was number one. The psalmist reveals that truth leads to the presence of God. Number two, truth and a human heart brings God pleasure. The, yeah, that's, that's what it says in Psalm 51, verses 6 through 7. The ESV version says that God desires or delights 
in truth. It brings in delight. The truth of God in a heart brings God delight. That's what, the, that's what David said. He said, behold, you desire or you delight in truth in the inward parts. In the hidden part, you shall make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. You know, God doesn't really need glasses to be able to see in our heart. He's got this, he's got his own little microscope thing that where he can he can examine the heart of man. Amen. In other words, what I'm trying to say is we've all done it. We've all we've all lived in sin after after faith in Christ. We've all we've all at least failed God at some point in time or we did something we weren't supposed to do. Come on. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to amen me. I'll be the guy. Uh, yeah, I, we've all done it, though. I believe you. You're not going to tell me you haven't fallen short of the glory of God since you've given your heart. The problem is that whenever we act like we're not really doing it. But, but that's what sin will do. I was having a conversation the other day, too, and we're like, well, 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 well look, whenever you get in sin, you don't feel the presence of the Lord. But you know what? God never quit doing what he was doing. He would, he, he did not that he woke up because God, the, the God of Israel does and sleep or slumber, but he he walked into the garden there, and he probably did not walk like that. He probably walked much less with much you know authority, but not with you know. And he walked into the garden, and he said, "Where are you, Adam? Why are you hiding behind the trees, Adam?" So it wasn't God didn't quit doing what he normally does. It, what sin did was it affected Adam and Eve and made them feel unworthy to be in God's presence. So they were the ones that were hiding yes. from the presence of the Lord. So while we may be in sin and feel like we don't feel the presence of God or hear the presence, hear the voice of God, it, God hasn't changed. It's us that has changed. Amen. And, and, and so I just want to encourage you to know that he desires truth on the end. We're parts. We're not hiding anything from him. That's right. That's right. Amen. And he's waiting for us to get right with him. Amen. He loves us so much. I want you to know that tonight. He loves us so much and he's proven his love. He sent his son Jesus to die for us. Amen. And, uh, and so he says, you desire truth. And let me just say this too. Psalm 51 is written after David sinned with Bathsheba. I want you to know that. And so in this, he says, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. So the Lord has his own uh, heart microscope that he can look in. He searches the hearts. Amen. He searches the inside. After the, the sin that David had with Bathsheba, he, it's like, and after his, his, he's been restored to God, he ends up writing a couple of different psalms, and he and he remembers back to that time frame in his life. It turned into quite the mess. You remember the story, right? I mean, he see he's out at a time when kings go out to war. David stayed at home, and he's up on his rooftop, and he's looking around. He wasn't even supposed to be there. He's supposed to be fighting with his men, and he sees. Bathsheba, a beautiful woman. He says, get that woman for me. And so he's just the king of the kingdom. He just does whatever he wants. And he pulls that woman in there. And we know the story. He impregnates her, right? And then now, now we got to hush the situation up, right? we got to hide it. So what he does is he pulls her husband, who was a, a major warrior, off the front line of the battle. And he, and he gives him some wine to try to get him drunk so that he'll, well, not at first, he tries to just get him to go lay with his wife. But the man's like, I'm not going to go lay with my wife whenever my, my brothers are on the battlefield. So then he tries to get him drunk thinking that that's going to do it. The man Uriah is like, you're not going to do it. And he slept on the door, yes. on the, at the outside on the, yes. door, the door frame, right? And, and so what he does is he writes a letter. David writes a letter to send Uriah the Hittite into the midst of the battle. And he says, whenever the fighting is fiercest, draw back from him. Ooh, like that's, that's bad. Premeditated murder, yeah, right? Yeah. And and you know, and neither one of those sins, there was no sacrifice. Both of those sins required stoning. But but God, but what, what I want you to know is, is this, and I know that Solomon said this the other day, and I don't mean to keep talking about him, but he said that he stepped into the future whenever he was able to sit in the presence of the Lord. But he also stepped into the future right here. Because when he says, purge me with his son, 
I need you to understand that what David would have known about hyssop, and I need you to understand this, is for the Passover. Because, see, David would have been a studier of the word of God. And for the Passover lamb, what they did was, they, you remember what the, the story of the Passover? They had to cut the animal's throat, collect his blood in a basin, and then it says with hyssop. It was like a plant that was very absorbent. It'd be like we have rags today, we have woven rags that we would maybe use, or some kind of a mop or a paintbrush that we would paint with. But this was an absorbent plant that they dipped I, I, I came up, I didn't come up with it, I double checked it. Take that sop, okay, you remember that sop, that Judas, but the word sop can also mean something that's thoroughly saturated. And so they take that hyssop and they would thoroughly saturate it with the blood and they painted the doorpost and the side post. And what I'm here to tell you is this, is that David knew that. It was in his heart. He had studied that since he was a young boy. And, and here he is, and he's guilty. He's guilty of grievous sins. But he wants to be able to, to ascend the hill of the Lord. He wants to be able to be in the presence of God. He wants his hands to be cleansed from the, from the, from the sin and the guilt that he's feeling in his life. And so he cries out and he says, Purge me with his son. Take that sop of blood and paint it on the doorpost of my heart, Lord, and cleanse me and have your way with me. Amen. And 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 listen, he 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 experienced it. Do you know, listen, sometimes we fall short of when we fall short of the glory of God. You know what the enemy wants to do? He wants to hold us in condemnation. That's right. He wants to hold us in guilt. Y'all know what I'm talking about? If you've ever failed the Lord. If you're not careful, you'll walk around under a cloud of guilt yes. for months, yes. for years. You don't have to live that way. That's a lie from the enemy. Jesus said that Satan, he speaks a language that's known. I, I mean, I came up with this one time. Lionese. He speaks one language. He speaks only lies. He's the father of lies. Yes. He knows this is what he speaks. It don't matter. He probably can speak Chinese and Vietnamese, and he can probably speak. He can speak Spanish. I'm sure he can speak every human language. But any language he's speaking in, what's coming out of his mouth is a lie. Right. And so I'm here to tell you that you do not have to live under condemnation and guilt. You do not have to live under that. Amen. Because if you call on the name of Jesus, if you call on the blood, hallelujah, it cleanses you of all unrighteousness. And that's the truth. Amen. And, and you know, but a lot of times we feel that weight and we, and listen, sometimes, man, I'm telling you right now, dude, it'll put you, it'll put you in a mess, man. You end up, you know, you, you'd be so tired from that condemnation. It's a weight. It'll just weigh you down. You, you, you can't even sit up in your chair half the time. You'd be just like weighed down, got a frown on your face. I mean, next thing you know, you'd be slipping down in your chair even more. I'm not going to do it because I might not be able to get up. But the next thing you know, you fall down on the ground. Like you're just walking around like this. Under, under this, you know, whenever David was feeling whatever he was feeling, he, the Bible says that he was mourning the, the child. You remember that? Because Bathsheba had to get, because look, there are consequences to sin. Yes. And, and, and that's just the reality. Even though he forgives us, there are some consequences. But I'm here to tell you that if you'll just get right with the Lord, you can start fresh and anew. And the Holy Spirit will start healing you. Amen. And so the Bible says that David clothed himself in sackcloth and he laid on the on the ground. I didn't go back and study, but I think it was like a week that he fasted. And then once he heard that the baby had died, you know what he did? He got up. He got up and he washed himself and he anointed himself and he went back to the table and he began to eat because there's a time for mourning and there's a time for being sorrowful, but there's a time to get up yes, and yes. get back to moving. Yes. I want to tell you, Christian, you don't yes. have to live perpetually under condemnation right. and guilt. Amen. Jesus paid a high price so that you can Free. get up and get moving again. Amen. Amen. Praise God. That's good. And, and so I wanted you to see that, that. And then ultimately, Jesus is the truth. If the, if the heel of the Lord is the presence of God, ultimately, Jesus is the truth. And now the truth lives on the inside of our heart. Now the presence of God lives on the inside of our heart. But let's go back real quick and let's talk a little bit about 
the suppression of the truth. If you go to, to Romans chapter, we can stay in the King James Version for this, but if you go to Romans chapter 1, we'll just hit some little hot spots. Let's start at verse uh, 22. So they're suppressing the truth. Mankind is so suppressing the truth, been suppressing the truth, right? And uh, it says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Talking about intellectual man. Can we say that? Because intellectual man thinks he's really smart, yep. right? And but, but what the Bible says is that they profess themselves to be wise, but in doing that, they actually became fools. But look what they did in verse 23. It says they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image. Now it says, ends up saying birds and four-footed beasts, but I just want to focus on this one thing right here. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like yes, to yes. corruptible man. This has been the work of the suppression of truth to convince man the whole new age thing and in other ways that you are your own God. That's what society is trying to convince you of. Now listen, don't get so focused on the word God as a deity. Basically though, it's telling you you can rule your own life yes. and you can live your life any way that you choose to. Whatever is going to bring you joy, whatever you think is going to bring you happiness, y y YOLO, you only live once. Yeah. Just go out there and do it. And listen, I'm being, the, the quote from the, the most wicked man in the last hundred years uh, it was this, do what thy wilt and let that be the whole of the law. Whatever you want it to be, you just do it. And so you become your own God and you chart out your own destiny. But whenever you do that, you're suppressing the truth. And I wanted to say this to you, Christian. Listen, you got, we got to be careful. Don't suppress the truth in your own life. God has not appointed you unto wrath. But let me tell you something. Jesus took your wrath on the cross. Amen. Yes. So you do not have to face the wrath of God that is talked about in Revelation if you are a true born again believer according to the doctrine of justification by faith you're either saved or you're not right. good news if you're truly saved hallelujah you will be with the lord amen but let me but let me just say this do not test god no. do not suppress the truth in your own life because when you start to turn your back on the truth of god it's going to have a similar effect that's taking place in the world today. You're going to slowly start spiraling downward away from the light and further into darkness. Good news is this, is that if you are a true child of God, he's not going to leave you there. Praise God. But why, why travel that way? Why go that way? Start whispering his name now. Call on his name, Jesus. Call on his name. Start whispering his name now, even though you know that you're in the darkness, even though you know that you have that you have suppressed the truth to some extent. I'm talking to somebody on video because I know I'm not talking to anybody in here tonight. But listen, if, you're, if you find yourself in a place of darkness and you feel like you're moving further down into a pit, start calling on the name of Jesus now and let the Holy Spirit write this course for you. Let him flood his light upon you and let him... Start pulling you back towards his truth. Amen. The, the world, the world in their own wisdom is suppressing the truth. And they they believe that they have, but 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 their wisdom made them fools in the eyes of God. And it says in verse 24, and then also in verse 26, and then also in verse uh, it, 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 verse 24 says this: God gave them up to uncleanness. Okay. And then in verse 26, it says, God gave them up unto vile affections. Okay. And then, and then, it, and then it says that he just, and he gave, he caused them to burn in lust. See, whenever, whenever man turns his back on God and his truth, what, what man is saying is, is that I know better for what I, what I want to do for myself. And because God created you with a free will, he will allow you to make decisions for yourself because God's not really looking for a robot. <laughs> God is love and he wants you to love him back just like he loves you. Amen. And so, so he will allow you to make those choices. And, but when you make those choices, it, it doesn't cause, it doesn't result in the intended, what you're looking for. 
right? And instead, it pulls you further away from the Lord. And so, but you'll, but, but what happens is, is that for people that are not truly living for God, this is what we see. This is what we see happening in the world today, that their heart is getting harder and harder against the things of God. And I'm telling you that what we're seeing now is just the beginning. Listen to me. It, it's just the beginning. It's going to get, and, it, and I believe that it's going to accelerate. Oh, I believe it's going to accelerate because it's been accelerating. It, it, it's, been, it's been going at, a, at, a, at an extremely fast pace. And, and it's just getting worse every time that we turn around. And so what ended up happening here is this. Now listen, you know, I've had somebody accuse me before. Well, it's not just a homosexual that can be reprobate. I never said that. It, but this is what it, this is what the scripture is, says right here. So we're staying true to the text. You know, listen, let's, let's be clear about something right now. The Lord loves homosexuals. You understand that? The Lord loves sinners. Yes. The Lord loves transgender people. Satan is lying to people. It's, Satan is lying to people and he's destroying them. He's telling them that, that, they can, that they also can love and they're calling this love, but it's not love, it's lust. It's not any more love than it would be if you were married and you had a relationship with a person you weren't married with. It's not any more love than if you are in a fornication relationship and you're living in the midst. That's not love because, see, love, as Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Yeah, yeah. Amen. And so, and, but this is the good news is that you can't do that in your own strength. You can't keep the commandments of the Lord in your own strength. You can't keep the sayings of Jesus in your own strength. That's why Jesus died so that the grace of the Holy Spirit could flow into your life and to empower you. See, the world is going to tell you that, and, and it's fine if you're not if you're not homosexual. You, then it, then you oh yeah, get a preacher, right? Get a preacher. But but if you're on internet pornography. And I don't say that uh, because, listen, I've been a, a believer that's been bound by that. So I don't say that lightly. But, but if, if that's your problem, th th then now, okay, well, that's a problem. <laughs> that's a problem. And the Lord, the Lord wants to deal with that. Okay, but what I'm trying to say is, is that the society that we live in, and that can result in a reprobate mind too. But a reprobate mind is the mind that God has pretty much given up on that mind. Because they've been turned over to the ways of Satan. Like, do you ever, have you ever seen, have you ever taught, is, I mean, if you know what I'm talking about, if you're a spirit-filled Christian and you've had a conversation with someone who, who doesn't, number one, they don't believe in God. And number two, they believe that everything that's happening in society is, is normal and that it's good. Sometimes, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you should go around judging who's got a reprobate mind and who doesn't. But I'm telling you, if you ever experience one, and, and it's not our job to do that. Everybody has an opportunity to hear the gospel. The Lord's already chastised me for that many, many years ago. But I do want you to know that a lot of times you can feel it. Or you can see them on TV whenever they're talking a certain way. You can say, man, like that's a reprobate mind right there. They're never, they're not going to, I mean, yes, God does miracles. He does, but they don't want anything to do with God, that's and right. and that's a sad, and, and so the world is increasingly moving in that direction. You understand where the world has a reprobate mind, and they're completely rejecting the things of God, and so this is the spiraling down of of moral depravity to the point where they start to do things that don't even make sense. The woman leaves the man. And woman goes with woman. That's what this is what the Bible says in Romans chapter one. The man leaves the woman, and men burn in lust one towards another. See, the reason that it doesn't make any sense is because you can't procreate. God created everything within itself that has seed that it would reproduce after its own kind. Okay, and so they cannot 
procreate. And so, so the reality of it is, is that, you know, I think it was John that told me this too. I thought this was really good. So I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Um, and that way I don't f feel like I'm stealing your stuff. John said this a while back. He said, no, you weren't born that way. I'm not questioning whether you were born that way. Wow. That was fresh. What? What you talking about, bro? Oh, you were born that way in Adam. You were born that way in Adam. You have a natural proclivity. You, you not maybe not you guys. Some of y'all got a natural, whatever. What was your old man? What was your old man stuff? Come on. Man stuff? Come on. You see what I'm getting at? Whatever your old man stuff was, is that that was the pathway that you went down. Yes. These people happen to be naturally going in that direction. But, but what John said, he, and I think he was talking to somebody at work. He said, I don't question whether or not that that person was born that way. And Adam, I'm just here to tell you, they need to get born again. Because when you get born again in Christ, you're not that anymore. Because the Bible says that he that is in Christ, behold, old things have passed away and all things have become new. You become a new creation in Christ Jesus. And so you might have been born with a proclivity to go towards alcoholism or drugs or fornication or pornography or whatever it was. But whenever you're born again, how Hallelujah. You become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Yeah, yeah. You received a new nature. Jesus lives on the inside of you. And you and I need to learn how to yield to him and let the Holy Spirit have his way Amen. in our lives. So that's part of the birth of the fallen nature. Yes. Right? And but this is what's happening. Is that is that whenever a society starts to, to spiral down, the, the Lord, listen, the word of God warned us. Paul wrote Romans probably about AD 50, AD 60, something like that. Paul warned us that the spiraling downward of society, it was happening in the Roman Empire. They were seeing it before their eyes that this is the, end, this is the result of it. And this is where we are. And it's so important that we understand where we are, the times that we're in, the signs in the seasons that we're in because we as the church we have to wake up we're not going to fix this in a voting booth my friends right. i mean right. go vote i'm yeah. not telling you don't vote but we're yeah. not going to fix this in a voting booth yeah. we need to wake up and we need to fall to our knees yeah. and we need to start crying out to god that he would begin yeah. to pour out his spirit upon his church we need we need the Lord to pour out his spirit upon the church so that the bride of Christ will be aroused from her slumber and aroused from her complacency so that we will stand up and be salt uh, to the earth, amen, and light to the world. We need God to do a, a work in our heart and our life. And so, listen, I have a lot more scripture and it's getting late, but I want to just close maybe with this, with this uh, last verse, verse 32. Because look, there's a line being drawn in the sand. And, and you could probably, I mean, I don't know because I don't get on Facebook, but I know that whenever they started talking about gay marriage many, many years ago, Danielle, I was already off of Facebook and she told me, she said, Matt, if you saw the Christian people yes, or the yes. people that go to church that are liking on that, oh, they have a right to love each other. Yep. They have a right to love each other. And, 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 you know, I was trying to share with, Danielle, because she she said that one time. She's like, I just felt bad for these parents, and I get it, dude. <laughs> I get it. But but this is the thing, and I kind of shared this with, with one of my daughters the other day. I was like, it's no different though than if one of my daughters was married, and then they came home with another man and said, Hey, I want you to meet my boyfriend. It's like, wait, hold on, what? <laughs> I, no, that doesn't that doesn't work because that's sin. And we can't, doesn't mean that I quit loving the person. I never stop loving the person that they're my child. I love them, but I'm not going to condone that. I'm not going to act like that behavior is okay. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be complicit to that. No, I'm not. And, and, and if that, I, well, I'm not going to be too sassy, but so let's look at verse 32 right here. It says, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Yeah. Now listen, let's not focus just on homosexuality or tra transgenderism because he said a lot of other things in there. 
He said truce breakers, disobedient to parents. It, it's a mindset. You understand that? It's a mindset where we're moving further and further away. And the word of God says this. It says that if you're in with them, that means your mind is working like that. And if your mind is working like that, then that means that you're not with the Lord. And, you, and what we have to have is we have to have the, the, the mind of Christ. And what the word of God says is the truth, not what the world is trying to convince us on. And the more we hang around with that, there's a, this is a spirit. Do, do you understand that? When I, when I started off, I said this. I said, <coughs> you're not in a wrestling match with flesh and blood. You're in a wrestling match in a spiritual War. You're in the midst of a spiritual battle. And if you keep hanging around with demonic spirits, I'm just going to tell you right now. If you keep hanging around with demonic spirits, if you keep hanging around with spirits of lust, you're going to fall into Amen. lust. That's right. sure. Sure. If you keep hanging around with spirits of homosexuality, like, like fellowshipping with that, you may very well... If, even if you don't fall into that sin, you'll fall into the sin of being in agreement with it. Yes. And, and, this, and, and, and listen, I, well, I really don't have anything more to say. I don't think. I think that the Word of God has said it. And I think that what we have to do is, we, even if we sometimes don't understand it, and it, even if sometimes we find ourselves maybe not understanding and disagreeing with some, something, when we know that this is the Word of God and we love God, we need to ask God to do a work in our heart. Yes. We need to ask God to cause our mind and our heart to line up with the truth of his word. Amen. Yes. Amen. Praise God.